although hip hop is keep it real, keeping it real doesn't mean keeping it street. You know what I mean? The streets are real. And, and I came from the streets and Wu-Tang came from the streets. But in all reality, we was always mixing in our mythology, mythology of comic books, chess, kung fu movies. Uh, so really nerd culture was still blended in this, in this gangster life. Throughout your career, what is very patently off, uh, obvious is that you're somebody who's not ever afraid to evolve. And so I want to ask you a question. I ask every guest that appears on this podcast since its name, Jamel Hill is Unbothered. When did you become unbothered? Mm -hmm. I think I became unbothered if I am unbothered. <laughs> no. I, I, at a certain point, um, I just accepted me for me. It could have been during my Bobby Digital years because that was probably when I, when I, when I caught the most negative criticism of me uh, from those who didn't understand. But yet there was a whole new attraction to me for those who did understand. And it was different people. It was like, um, just a different crowd was showing up to, to hang out with me. Even when I was doing Grave Diggers, it was like, it wasn't my, my homies from the hood that was, you know, they pulled up in the Benzes. It was people that walked up, you know what I mean? People that skateboarded up, you know what I mean? People that had tattoos and spikes in their hands or whatever. I was like, okay, I'm attracting them right now, all good. And when that started happening for me, I became unbothered as you asked, because at the end of the day, I was like, yo, everybody don't gotta like me. I better like me though. And I better know that it's only me. It's, um, it's only one of me right here. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, even though my sons and my daughters may be able to have essence of me and maybe they'll grow into some form of me, but in the whole mathematical composition of the whole biochemical equation, Okay, it's only one of me, and I'm very comfortable with that. So at what point did you start to really look at yourself as an artist and not just the music guy, the rapper, the producer? When did you yourself say, you know what, I'm an artist. I'm not just this one thing or this one thing. It was during the same period. When the, the Bobby Digital creation, I had to accept that Although hip hop is keep it real, um, keeping it real doesn't mean keeping it street. You know what I mean? The streets are real. And, and I came from the streets and Wu-Tang came from the streets. But in all reality, we was always mixing in our mythology, mythology of comic books, chess, kung fu movies. Uh, so really nerd culture was still blended in this, in this gangster life you know what I mean, that we was living because, you know, somebody like Method Man would be outside with a gun in his pocket. I don't mean to talk about it like that, but I'm saying he could be outside with a gun in his pocket, uh, chasing down the car to try to sell some crack, right? But yet when he's in his crib, he's, 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 he's playing on a video game or he's tw tw uh, flipping the pages of a comic book. You know what I mean? And, they, and people in the street won't fuck with him, right? Right, because he'll, you know, 6'4", he'll knock you out, right? But still, he goes back into that childlike mind when he's, in his, when he's in his own home. So that neuroculture thing. So as an artist, when I said to myself, I'm an artist, is when I created Bobby Digital because I'm creating something that can't be tangibly connected to, to the streets, can't be tangibly connected to um, the, the keep it real concept of hip hop because it's actually... It's all imagination now. It's, and when I realized it, I think Robert De Niro helped me because I think around the same time I saw Cape Fear. And he, you know, Robert De Niro's, you know, we, we know him for his mafia movies, you know what I mean? We love him when he's Goodfellas, Casino, you know what I mean? Godfather, Two, uh, Taxi Driver, you know, we know him, Mean Streets, we know, we know that's Robert De Niro to us, but now he's coming in playing some psychopathic killer. Right, <laughs> and, and, he, and, he, and he, he slayed it, I mean, what a performance. And I was like, wait a minute, now I understand why I have all these different personas about myself, all these different names I got up for myself. And I accepted, yo, I'm an artist, man. And Bobby Digital is an expression of my art, uh, just like Prince Rakim was an expression of it, you know what I mean? 
Well, uh, Bobby De Niro is a great example um, because he not only went from psychopath or mafia guy psychopath, then he is starting starring in lighthearted comedies. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Next thing you know, he's with Ben Stiller playing his father-in-law. <laughs> exactly, making us laugh all day. And that's what I mean. So art is like that. And then once you know you are artists, there's something else you have to recognize, which I recognize is that, okay, that means I could translate my art in multiple forms. It don't have to just be lyrical. I already proved it when I was making beats and when I was doing lyrics, right? And now I'm d- directing my own videos. And also now musically, I'm not just sampling what was already, you know, digging for crates. I'm actually learning the song structure or shall I say orchestra structure. I'm like doing 16 bar phrases and 32 bar phrases of music before the repeats. So I'm like, wait a minute, because my mind is going there. It's like, I'm, 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 and so that became even more, uh, when I realized that I can manifest it on multiple levels, I started to do that. And that led for me becoming a composer, left me being brave enough to even become an actor, because really I wouldn't act in the early phases of the RZA. First of all, we never wore makeup in our videos. Oh, we really? Okay. Yeah, we didn't, we, didn't want, no, we didn't allow makeup. If you put on makeup, that was sucker. You know what I mean? And and look, and for videos, maybe it is. You know what I mean? Maybe, you know what I mean? But when I started, then start playing with acting, well, that's part of the process. You know what I mean? It's part of the art form. You know what I mean? An actor put on stuff to make their hair longer. They put a mole on their face or, or you know, women will put the lipstick and the, and the blush and, and pierce the eyes, you know, whatever, you know, to make that character exist. And so when I accepted art and it started acting, I accepted the, the stage of what that was. And that led to me being in front of uh, directors. Now I'm in front of directors and I'm seeing that. And I'm like, wait, that's a, a, a macro of my micro. Because when I make an album, I'm actually directing. But now, as an artist, I'm like, wait, I can actually multiply that micro to a macro. And I learned how to, to how to direct films. And you know, and I just kept growing. You um you mentioned a moment ago about how when you were in uh doing Bobby Digital about how the you saw the crowd kind of evolve and change a little bit. And one thing that I've noticed as somebody who um can still remember the very first time I heard Cream, like the very I can still remember like when the album dropped, because it was my senior year in high school, um, I noticed over the over time how much the fan base for the Wu Tang Clan has completely changed. The core fan base is still there. Don't get me wrong, but you know, real talk, you might go to a Wu Tang concert. It might be more white people in there than black people, which is wild to me because you know y'all were just y'all kept it real. Y'all was street. You know, you represented not just a generation, um, but kind of the, the the every man neighborhood that we were all experiencing. What do you think was the turning point? Or like, when did that happen? Like, how did that evolution take place? I think that once you start going platinum and multi-platinum, in order to do that, you have to have our white brothers in the country and white brothers around the world buying it because the 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 number of, of, of consumers has to multiply. And eventually, if you look at, you know, just America alone, um, if you go to any uh, hip hop concert, you're gonna see more white brothers now than blacks, you know what I mean? Most, most, you know what I mean? You'll get some artists in some territories where, you know, it's just, it's like, like, like there's a lot of blacks. So let's, let's use Atlanta as a, as a, as a template. So now in, in Atlanta, at first, it was mostly blacks at Wu concerts. Right. Uh, and our fan base was, um, you know, wasn't in the, you know, multiple, you know, a couple of thousand. Like it wouldn't be like eight to ten thousand people standing there in the beginning. You know what I mean? Because first of all, it was, it was the South and and it was the black fan base. But as years went on, that fan base increased. But it's, it, it becomes 50 50 at one point, 50 percent black, 50 percent white, because now that population is joining. But then in some cities. Like now, if you take it back down to, uh, 
you know, to Utah, where of course the population is, is mostly white brothers there anyway. But yeah, you'll go do, we did a concert in Utah, 10,000 people. And maybe it was maybe it was three hundred blacks there, five hundred blacks. You know what I mean? So basically, all the black people in Utah came to that. 